a beautiful island off the African coast would be a dream destination for holidaymakers. But a bomb at the airport diverts two jumbos to a tiny airstrip. In just eight minutes, the worst aviation accident of all time takes the lives of 583 people. Now, with cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Europe, the Canary Islands, Tenerife. Sunday, March the 27th, 1977. Los Rodeos is the island's sleepy airport in the hills. It's not used to heavy traffic and normally handles just a few small planes a day. But this is no ordinary day. 12 noon. After an overnight flight from Los Angeles, Pan Am's flight 1736 is just two hours away from the Canary Islands. Joan Jackson has been a flight attendant with Pan Am for seven years. Everything seemed normal and fine. And sometimes you get passengers that you wish were on somebody else's flight, but these were all really wonderful people and we enjoyed having them on our plane. Jack Riddart is one of the 378 passengers happy that he's on board a 747. Back in the 70s, I mean, the 747 was the cat's meow. I mean, it, it was it. It was twice as big as any other airplane. Jack is traveling in style. He's taking his girlfriend, Joni, on a special vacation. It was a wonderful first-class trip. We went to the upper deck in those days. It was a, kind of a cocktail lounge. Very nice. They're heading for Gran Canaria the third largest of seven Canary Islands, known for their stunning scenery. But as beautiful as the islands are, they also harbor a number of terrorist groups eager to free the islands from Spanish rule. Twelve thirty p.m. Suddenly, Pan Am's captain, Victor Grubbs, receives an urgent message from air traffic control. A bomb has exploded at Gran Canaria Airport, where he's due to land. He must now head for Los Rodeos Airport on the nearby island of Tenerife. He then tells the passengers what's happened. I was concerned. I'm sure all of the uh, passengers were. 1.38 p.m. Pan Am 747 is not the only plane diverted because of the bomb. Another jumbo, KLM flight 4805 from Amsterdam, is also diverted to Tenerife's Los Rodeos airport. It touches down ahead of the Pan Am plane. Three other diverted planes are already on the ground. Tenerife airport is small. There's only one airstrip, and the air traffic controllers are not used to so many aircraft, let alone jumbo jets. And it's Sunday, so only two controllers are on duty. The passengers on the KLM plane set off towards the airport lounge to relax. 2.15. The Pan Am 747 touches down. It joins the KLM on the tarmac, waiting for Gran Canaria's airport to reopen. Gran Canaria is just a 25-minute hop away but it could be some time before police there declare the airport safe from bombs. No one knows how long they'll be kept here. Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport is situated in a valley in the shadow of the great Mount Tede, the third largest volcano on Earth. Tede dominates the island and even influences the weather. So far today, the sun is shining, but conditions can change at any moment. The airport is at an altitude of 632 meters above sea level. 
low-lying clouds frequently roll down the mountains, shrouding the airport in heavy fog. But when the Pan Am plane lands, weather isn't a problem. The conditions were good. They were clear and a beautiful day. I noticed that the airport was uh, in a little disrepair. Medieval, to say the best. Los Rodeos Airport opened in 1941. Facilities are severely limited. There's no radar to monitor planes on the ground. And today the runway center lights are out of service. With five big jets now diverted there as well, the airport can barely cope. The departure lounge is overcrowded. Passengers inside the Pan Am Jumbo are not allowed to leave the plane. The flight attendant opens the door to give the passengers some fresh air. I remember we were waiting. We were there long enough to be bored. Say, you know, when are we going to go? Two thirty p.m. Police in Gran Canaria have cleared the bomb, and the passengers think they'll soon be able to get to their destination and start their vacations. But even though the Pan Am plane is ready to take off, it can't. The KLM Jumbo, ahead of it on the taxiway, is refueling. Filling the Jumbo with 55,000 liters of fuel will take 30 minutes. The Pan Am is forced to wait. The pilots were very eager to go. I think they would have preferred the KLM had not taken on the extra fuel that we'd all just gone ahead and gone. But even after the KLM finishes refueling, there's still a delay. With no explanation, the Spanish authorities force the planes to sit on the tarmac for nearly two more hours. At 4.56 p.m., KLM's most senior pilot, Captain Jakob Van Zanten, requests permission to taxi. Two minutes later, air traffic control gives the go-ahead. On the Pan Am, Jack notices a change in the weather. The fog started rolling in, and uh, it was quite unusual to me because it would completely consume the airport. It was the difference between night and day. The KLM 4805 taxis down the runway. There are 248 passengers and crew on board. The air traffic controllers instruct the pilots to proceed to the end of the airstrip, make a 180 degree turn, and wait for clearance to take off. Visibility is now down to 300 meters. None of the air traffic controllers can see the planes that they're directing. And there is no ground radar to help them. They are now totally reliant on communicating by radio. 5.02 p.m. The controllers give Pan Am permission to taxi onto the runway right behind the KLM. The Pan Am pilots are then told to turn off at the third exit and wait. Conditions are getting worse by the second. I followed the KLM plane up on the tarmac and you couldn't see the cement. You couldn't see anything. It was dark. 504. The KLM is completing its 180 degree turn and getting into position for takeoff. The Pan Am is still taxiing towards the KLM along the runway. The pilot and co-pilot are trying to find the third exit, but they're not familiar with the airport and can barely see out of their cockpit windows. I said, look at this fog, we're never going to take off because I can't even see the number two engine, which is the inboard engine. And you know, I, I know we're not going. 505, the KLM is in position. After a delay of three and a half hours, Captain Van Zanten is finally ready to leave. 506. Captain Van Zanten releases the brakes. The 747 starts heading down the runway towards the Pan Am, which is still on the airstrip, just 1,400 meters up ahead.
A KLM jumbo jet is heading down the runway in thick fog. But a Pan Am jumbo is still taxiing towards it on the same airstrip. Jack and Joni are in Pan Am's first class. Johnny said, oh my God, you know, what would happen if he took off? And I just casually said to her, well, don't worry about a thing. If he hits us head on, you'll never feel a thing. 5.06 and 18 seconds. The control tower tells the KLM crew to wait. Okay, stand by for takeoff. I but they don't. Instead, Captain Van Zanten accelerates the KLM jumbo down the runway. 5.06 and 45 seconds. The Pan Am co-pilot looks out of the window and is horrified by what he sees. The 300,000 kilogram KLM jumbo is heading straight towards him. The Pan Am has 394 passengers and crew on board. Their only chance is to get out of the way as quickly as possible. Pan Am's Captain Grubbs forces the engines to full throttle. He tries to move the 747 out of the way. I heard the engines rev, and we made a really hard, sharp left-hand turn. Get off, get off. But it's too late. 5.06 and 50 seconds. The KLM smashes into the American Jumbo at 290 kilometers per hour. Just a shattering noise. I felt like every molecule of air exploded. My only thought was, bombs, it's got to be bombs. And all you could see was the twisted metal parts. Then almost immediately the fire broke out. And I looked around and thought, well, you know, how are we going to get out? We're trapped. The air traffic controllers hear the explosions, but because of the fog, they can't see anything. They're unable to make radio contact with either plane. The KLM 747 has careered into the Pan Am, slicing off the upper deck. After the impact, the KLM crashes further down the runway. The tower controllers sound the alarm. These first news pictures show the firefighters tackling the blaze which has engulfed the KLM. They can't find any survivors. Because of the fog, they have no idea that just 450 meters up the runway, the Pan Am Jumbo is also in flames, with hundreds of people still on board. Without a moment's hesitation, Jack Ridout immediately sets about helping other passengers. There was raw fuel, and I had it all over me. I was drenched in it. I thought, we gotta get these people out of here. So I started just literally slinging people out that door. Meanwhile, Joan Jackson and another flight attendant are trying to escape. I think I must have gone through this hole and I reached back down and said, Suzanne, give me your hand, and pulled her out and we found ourselves standing on top of the aircraft. The shattered Pan Am Jumbo can no longer move, but its engines are still running at full power. And I could hear them, the clanging of the metal in there, and they were starting to disintegrate and throw pieces of metal around. There was another explosion, and the flight attendant who had been helping people was killed instantly. Joan and her colleague are still stuck on the roof of the plane. And I thought to myself, if we jump, we're going to have broken legs. Are we going to be able to get away from the plane if we have broken legs? But the plane begins to disintegrate beneath them. The fuselage where it had broken was kind of trailing down toward the ground. And I think we all just tried to leap for the ground and kind of get away from the plane. Another explosion blasts Jack out of the plane. 
Joni told me that I came out back forward. And when I became conscious, she said, we've got to get out of here. And then we kind of staggered as far away from the plane as we could. And then finally, the last explosion just took, took everything out but the wings. Of 396 people on board, there are just 61 survivors. Joan Jackson and her colleague escape with bruises and scratches. We couldn't believe that we had so few people. We, we just kept looking around for the rest of the people and the rest of the crew. I kept thinking, if I walk around to the other side of the plane, I'm going to find 400 people and all my friends on the crew. Um, but of course, that wasn't the case. And we just couldn't believe it. Jack Ridout helped to rescue 12 people. He's left with third degree burns on his head and arms. I guess this was kind of my own private Vietnam. It was awful. It was carnage. Everybody on the KLM 747 and most of those on the Pan Am have perished in the crash. It's the worst aviation accident in history. In all, 583 people have lost their lives. Around the world, people are shocked. The jumbo jet is the most advanced aircraft of its time. But it also carries twice as many passengers as any other commercial plane. And now, the burnt-out remains of two 747s lie scattered on the runway. Now we rewind the events of that fateful day and go deep into the investigation to reveal what really happened. The Spanish immediately bring in a team of specialists. Accident investigator Jaime Velarde leaves his home in Madrid at once, reaching Tenerife by first light. When we arrive, we actually notice the sensation of the big catastrophe. Investigators arrive from America and the Netherlands, representing the two countries whose planes have crashed. One of the Dutch team is Franz Erhardt, who's stunned by what he sees. We were appalled. It was tremendous, the amount of wreckage. We had never seen that before. Investigators must answer many questions. Why was the Pan Am Jumbo still on the runway? Was there another bomb? Using their official data, we can piece together the deadly chain of events. In the beginning, I didn't suspect anything. That was not the moment of taking conclusions. The only important thing is the evidence, nothing else. The first task is to find the black boxes. They contain vital voice recordings from inside both cockpits, as well as all the technical data. The investigators soon recover them, but... The boxes are badly damaged. It may take weeks to decipher the recordings. In the meantime, investigators have to rely on the next best thing, the tapes from the air traffic control tower. The tension was enormous because that was the first sign of who was the main reason for the accident. The investigators listen intently to the final moments before the crash. They need to find out why the KLM 747 took off while a Pan Am Jumbo was still on the runway. Did the tower controller give the pilot permission to depart? One minute, 23 seconds before the crash. The KLM completes its 180 degree turn at the end of the runway. And the KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff and we're waiting for our ATC clearance. This is not a request for takeoff clearance. 
but a request for air traffic control clearance. The pilots are seeking directions for once they're airborne. The controller issues the ATC clearance and the KLM co-pilot reads it back. 33 seconds before the collision. The tapes reveal that after reading back his ATC clearance, the KLM co-pilot makes an unusual statement. We're now at takeoff. American investigator Bill Edmonds is puzzled by what he heard. We couldn't understand exactly whether he was saying we are at takeoff or we are taking off. If we are at takeoff, that means we're ready to take off or the other would be that they're actually in the process of taking off. 28 seconds. The Spanish air traffic controller also seems confused by what the KLM co-pilot has just said. Okay, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. Stand by is the last instruction from the tower to the KLM. They never issue takeoff clearance. Nevertheless, Captain Van Zanten accelerates down the runway. The control tower tapes seem to suggest that the Dutch pilot has made a serious error of judgment. This man, for reasons that we'll have to investigate, uh, took off without permission. Van Zanten is one of Holland's star pilots. He was so highly regarded that KLM used his face in their advertising. He'd been a commercial pilot for 27 years and had flown more than 11,700 hours. It's shocking that such an experienced pilot would make such a drastic error. The evidence appears to be damning, but the investigation is far from over. Listening to the black box voice recorders is still several days away. Meanwhile, the tower tapes reveal another startling fact. The Pan Am pilots had not followed their instructions either. Four minutes before the crash. The control tower instructs the Pan Am to turn off the runway at the third exit. But investigators now know that the planes collided further up the runway near the fourth exit much closer to the KLM's takeoff position. Why did the Pan Am captain miss his turnoff? The worst air accident in history happened on the ground at Tenerife's Los Rodeos airport. Control tower tapes have revealed that KLM pilot Jakob Van Zanten took off without clearance. Now, using advanced graphics based on the Spanish government's official report, we go deep into the investigation to discover exactly what went wrong. Investigators have made another startling revelation. The Pan Am overshot its exit and was in the way. Did Pan Am's Captain Grubbs make a fatal error? To find out, investigators first analyze the airport layout. Los Rodeos is a small airport with just one airstrip and a taxiway at the side. There are four access lanes between the taxiway and the runway. On the day of the crash, controllers at Tenerife have to handle extra planes because the airport at Gran Canaria is closed. They have no choice but to park them on the taxiway. To reach takeoff position, the planes all have to use the runway. Investigators now examine the exact position of the planes on the airstrip moments before the crash. Four minutes and 46 seconds before impact. The Pan Am follows the KLM onto the runway. The Pan Am crew are using a small diagram to help them locate exit C3. But the exits are not clearly marked, and visibility is getting worse. As they taxi down the runway, they look out of the window to try to count the turnings as they go past them. 
first C1, and then C2. The problem is the third exit, C3. There does seem to be some uncertainty on the part of the Pan Am crew as to what taxiway they're supposed to, to uh, turn off on. However, the tower tapes clearly demonstrate the controller's instructions. Would you confirm that you want the Clipper 1736 to turn left at the third intersection? The third one, sir. One, two, three, third one. One minute, six seconds to disaster. The Pan Am passes exit C3, continuing on the runway towards the KLM, which is preparing to take off. But exit C3 would have required the jumbo to make a very difficult turn at an acute angle. The American investigators believe it was a practical impossibility, and the crew may have thought so too. The geometry that we drew out indicated that the Pan Am aircraft could not have made it. In my mind, had I been the captain of the airplane, I don't think I would have attempted a turn of that sort. But if the turn is so difficult, why did the controller ask the Pan Am to make it? Probably because he was not used to 747s. Other aircraft could have performed the maneuver very easily. But American investigators believe there's another reason why Captain Grubbs misses the C-3 exit. Just at the time he should be leaving the runway at exit C-3, the Pan Am pilot is distracted by what he hears on his radio. KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff and we're waiting for our ATC clearance. They probably would have been listening to the KLM aircraft rather than concentrating on turning off on the taxiway. 35 seconds to go. The KLM co-pilot tells control. We're now at uh, takeoff. Immediately, the Pan Am co-pilot butts into the conversation. We're still taxiing down the runway, the Clipper 1736. Inside the KLM, the pilot and crew are getting all radio transmissions. They should hear that the Pan Am Jumbo is still on the runway ahead of them. But Captain Van Zanten, the most experienced pilot in the Dutch fleet, increases the thrust of his engines and accelerates down the airstrip. Investigators now know that none of the pilots on either plane followed the controller's instructions. To find out why, investigators have to dig deeper. It may boil down to the behavior of the two crews. Transcripts of the control tower tapes reveal a growing level of tension in the KLM cockpit. The captain did express or exhibit a definite uh, hurry-up tendency. The KLM jumbo has been waiting at Tenerife for almost three and a half hours. Investigators later find out from radio conversations that Captain Van Zanten had expressed concern about going over the number of hours he's allowed to work. He still has to pick up 300 passengers in Gran Canaria to take back to Amsterdam. If he's late, the crew will be grounded for a rest period, and KLM will have to pay overnight accommodation for everyone on board. And now the fog is rolling in, causing very low visibility. He's feeling the pressure. I think every captain thinks that all the problems are on the ground, and as soon as you take off, problems are over. There you are in your kingdom, and you are the person who decides. In the mind of this captain, I think, that happened exactly the same. The American Airline Pilots Association also looked into the psychological factors of the case. Star pilot Captain Van Zanten was KLM's senior instructor, 
and in the last six years had spent most of his time training other pilots. If an individual spends too much time in the training center and not enough time out on the line, then he becomes more used to the training environment. In fact, in the past six years, Captain Van Zanten had flown an average of just 21 hours per month. And he'd not flown at all in the last 12 weeks. Bill Edmonds suggests that a phenomenon called training syndrome causes pilots to blur the distinction between the real world and the unreal world. With a simulator, you go ahead and you fly a maneuver, you stop, you reset the simulator, you refly the maneuver. You kind of get used to jumping around and you're ready to do something and you go ahead and do that. In the simulator, the instructor acts as the controller. He usually issues ATC clearance and takeoff clearance to the crew. He wouldn't have to wait for clearance from a control tower. Captain Van Zanten was ready to perform his takeoff. At a certain point, all the parameters were satisfied for his takeoff and he was ready to go. Not sure that he looked at the big picture of where they were on the runway, where other air traffic might have been, but um, he was ready to go. The effect of training syndrome on Van Zanten can never be proved. But another mystery remains. 18 seconds before the crash. Captain Van Zanten thrusts his engines into full power. Two other crew members are sharing the controls. Why didn't they stop him? Control tower tapes have revealed that KLM's Captain Van Zanten took off without clearance. Investigators have also discovered that the Pan Am Jumbo missed its exit and was in the way. Now investigators are waiting for the evidence from the plane's damaged black boxes. They could reveal new clues. Each 747 has two black boxes. The flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder which stores the final 30 minutes of all conversations inside the cockpit. Spanish investigator Jaime Velarde took the black boxes to Washington, where they were examined in the National Transportation Safety Board's special laboratory. It was very, very heavy investigation because you had to analyze practically every one of the recorded voices. So far, investigators have relied upon tapes from the control tower. But two weeks into the investigation, they can finally examine the tapes from the black boxes. It can take several days to listen to a half-hour cockpit voice recorder. When you try to identify who's speaking, what they're saying, and what other interactions may be going on. Only when investigators compare the black box tapes from the two planes with the recordings from the control tower do they get the full story. They make a dramatic discovery. In the KLM cockpit, the crew didn't hear certain directions that were clearly audible on the control tower tapes. Just when Captain Van Zanten most needed his radio communications, a loud squeal obliterated vital messages. Patrick Smith is a commercial pilot who studied many air disasters. Communicating to air traffic control the way we do is just so second nature. You don't think of it potentially being something that could break down and kill you. Here, a very simple technological problem lent a hand to this massive accident. The communication system in use at Los Rodeos in 1977 is still used all around the world today. Airplanes communicate with air traffic control using two-way VHF radios. All the planes at the airport tune into the same frequency, 
so that not only can they receive their instructions, they can also hear what's going on around them. But the system has limitations. It's not the same as speaking over the telephone where two people can talk at a time. The best way to, to picture it is if anybody's ever used a walkie-talkie, you click and you speak. Only one person can speak on that frequency at a time. Everyone must wait their turn. A problem occurs when two or more people try to use the frequency at the same time. It causes a loud, noisy squeal, known as a heterodyne. Hearing a heterodyne on an open frequency is 999 times out of a thousand. It's an innocuous phenomenon. But the accident at Tenerife was that one in a thousand, where the heterodyne was not harmless. 67 seconds before impact. Captain Van Zanten has completed his difficult 180 degree turn at the end of the runway. The flight data recorder reveals that he opens the throttle. The cockpit voice recorder reveals that the co-pilot is alarmed. Wait a minute, we don't have an ATC clearance. Captain Van Zanten's reply is curt. No, I know that, but go ahead, ask. 44 seconds before impact. While the KLM co-pilot is reading back the ATC clearance to the controller, the data recorder reveals that Van Zanten has already begun to accelerate. He doesn't wait for the co-pilot to finish. 37 seconds. We're going. But the Pan Am Jumbo is still taxiing on the runway. From the tower tapes, investigators know the controller told the KLM plane to wait for takeoff clearance. Okay, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. At that exact moment, the Pan Am cockpit tapes reveal that the Pan Am crew also responds. We're still taxiing down the runway, the Clipper 1736. They're both responding at the same time. But the KLM cockpit tape reveals that because both Pan Am and the controller speak at the same time, it creates a heterodyne. Okay. Captain Van Zanten simply hears the word, OK. He doesn't hear the controller. Okay, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. Nor does he hear the Pan Am. We're still taxiing down the runway, the Clipper 1736. He continues accelerating down the runway. Either one of those statements should have stopped him in his tracks, but because those two transmissions were made simultaneously, all he heard was a garbled noise. Just 28 seconds later, the KLM Jumbo smashes into the Pan Am. The Dutch investigator feels that this discovery has cleared Van Zanten of any blame. This was a breakthrough in our investigation, and I'm pretty sure that if the KLM had heard these messages, he would not have continued his takeoff. The interference happened 30 seconds before impact, blocking two vital messages. But even after that, the cockpit tapes reveal that Van Zanten had one final warning. 24 seconds before the crash. The Spanish controller makes a second call to Pan Am about its status on the runway. Papa Alpha 1736, report runway clear. The Pan Am co-pilot responds. Okay, we'll report when we're clear. This conversation was definitely audible in the KLM cockpit, but only one member of the crew was aware of it. The flight engineer understood it, at least partially. The Pan Am, is he not clear? The captain that is in the middle of the takeoff says something, what do you say? What do you say? The Pan Am, is he not clear? Van Zanten replied emphatically, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, flight engineer doesn't reply anymore. The flight engineer was the most junior member of the crew. Dismissed by his highly respected captain, 
he doesn't question him further. Both the Spanish and American investigators are critical of Captain Van Zanten's performance that day. But the final analysis shows that fate was against him. Captain Van Zanten took off without clearance and crashed the KLM Jumbo into a Pan Am 747 on the same runway. However, investigators now discover that he made one final attempt to avert disaster. Just seconds before he slammed into Pan Am, Captain Van Zanten tried to lift the KLM plane over the top of it. He pulled the nose up so sharply that the tail scraped the runway. He nearly made it. The nose and front wheel cleared the Pan Am, but the jumbo still couldn't climb high enough. The KLM's number one engine only had to graze the tip of Pan Am's right side to bring catastrophe. The final irony was that Captain Van Zanten had taken on an extra 55,000 liters of fuel to save refueling time later in Gran Canaria. It was this extra fuel that may have made the jumbo just too heavy to climb the extra few meters in height that could have prevented the disaster. The refueling of KLM can be considered as, uh, as a factor, of course. When you are more heavy, your takeoff run is longer. The disaster at Tenerife was caused by a chain of events combining both human error and technical failure. Pilot and aviation writer Patrick Smith believes that new technology can stop VHF radio squeals and help prevent future accidents. Heterodynes are preventable. There is a blocking device that can be inserted into the communication systems of airliners that prevents simultaneous transmission. Anybody who attempts a simultaneous transmission will be blocked out from speaking over the microphone. Aircraft engineers can fit anti-blocking units for just $13,000. A small amount compared to a new plane's price tag of up to $200 million. However, although some airlines are voluntarily installing them, it's not yet a legal requirement. Investigators finally pieced together the critical events that led to the tragedy at Tenerife. First, the air traffic controllers instructed two 747s to taxi onto the same active runway at the same time. Then, in heavy fog and confused by the runway layout, the Pan Am pilot missed his exit and taxied too far. Just seconds later, Dutch pilot Captain Van Zanten began his takeoff without clearance. Finally, a loud squeal in the KLM cockpit prevented the captain from receiving vital messages which may have stopped him in his tracks. For the survivors of Tenerife, the nightmare continued for many months. I found that I was frightened of everything. I didn't want to ride in a car. I didn't want to let my husband out of my sight. Um, I almost wanted to be in my apartment with the curtains drawn and like, like you see the people in the movies that are afraid of everything. After counseling, Joan managed to return to flying three months later. Well, I'm still a flight attendant today. I have 34 years of flying, and I will probably be flying um, another six, eight years. I love seeing the world. Back home in San Diego, Jack's story made the news. Jack Ridout is a survivor and is credited with the rescue of a dozen other passengers on a Pan Am 747, the nightmare of Tenerife. The thing that no one can ever understand until I've been involved uh, in a situation like this is that the ramifications go on year after year. I live with the images probably for the first year every night, most nights. Jack's rescue efforts were recognized by President Carter, who sent him a letter of gratitude on behalf of the nation. A new airport in the south of Tenerife 
now handles the majority of the island's visitors. Built at sea level, it rarely suffers from fog. Tenerife's old airport remains open, and the authorities have installed a ground radar system. Since the accident, the airstrip has been used mainly for regional flights between the islands. But today, a vast increase in tourism has seen the return of large aircraft, both landing and taking off, in the fog at Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport.